Welcome everybody to the Computational Sustainability Virtual Seminar Series. This virtual seminar series is being organized by CompSysNet with support from the National Foundation and Cornell University. My name is Carla Gomes. I'm the director of CompSysNet. I'm hosting the seminar today on behalf of Doug Fisher. Doug Fisher and I will be scheduling talks on computational sustainability regularly and posting them to the URL given on this slide. In two weeks, Professor Christian Kersting of the Technical University of Dortmund in Germany will be speaking. If you'd like to give a talk uh, 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 at a, another time, please let us know. Also, please consider visiting the CompSysNet website, Facebook page, LinkedIn page, blog, or see recordings of talks on the CompSysNet YouTube channel, including this talk and others from this virtual seminar series. We'd like you to become part of the computational sustainability community. During the webinar, the webinar you can ask questions to the speaker, which we will convey to the speaker as time allows. If you would like, find the chat window now and write hello to everybody. It's wonderful having you here. We actually have a, a, a packed seminar. And it is a pleasure to introduce today's speakers, Paul Fackler. Paul is a professor of agriculture and resource economics and associate professor of applied ecology at North Carolina State University and an internationally recognized teacher and scholar in the areas of decision analysis and computational methods. He co-authored a, a widely used textbook on the use of computational methods, applied computational economics and finance, along with the CompEcon toolbox, a package of computer programs used in both teaching and research. The main fo focus of his research currently is the application of dynamic optimization tools to problems involving the management of natural resources. He's also the developer of MDP Solve package for solving dynamic optimization problems. Thank you, Professor Fakra, for giving us this talk, and thank you to everyone who is listening. We are very excited to be growing this computational sustainability community. Well, thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, um, I've really enjoyed the, the seminars that we've had so far that I've attended, and this is a great series, and it's, a, it's an honor to be a part of it. Um, the topic of my talk today, I want to talk about um, stochastic dynamic programming, which is something I think probably most of the people participating here will know something about. Um, and <clears throat> the basic uh, take-home message that I want to share with you is that we can do stochastic dynamic programming without actually forming transition matrices. And there's some very um, good computational reasons for wanting to do that. We can solve larger problems um, at quicker and using less memory resources if we just avoid forming transition matrices. So that's kind of my take home message. I hope I'll convince you that it's not only possible and desirable, but fairly easy to do. So, uh, here's an outline of the basic talk. I'm going to briefly review dynamic programming and some issues, some, some approaches that I take to using it. Then I'm going to introduce the idea of an expected value or EV function, which is what I'm going to replace transition matrices with. And there's uh, a number of uh, different types of models that where this uh, is advantageous to do. Um, I'll spend a fair amount of time talking about factored models and how we can solve factored models that have conditional independence uh, with these EV functions. Um, for the most part, the talk will be um, in the context of problems with discrete states and actions, but at the end I'll talk about problems with continuous states and actions, uh, and then I'll wrap up. So dynamic programming, basically the idea of dynamic programming is we have a set of states, S, actions, A. We have a reward function that tells us um, how states and actions map into utilities. And we have a state transition probability matrix, which gives us next periods, states, 
the probability of next period states S plus in terms of current states and actions. And then together with a discount factor, we are attempting to solve uh, a, a problem that maximizes uh, the stream of expected returns or rewards over time. Uh, essentially, we're trying to find a strategy uh, with, that maps states into actions that maximizes our current reward plus our discounted expected future value. Uh, that's, we get that representation through the Bellman equation. <clears throat> the, it's well known that dynamic programming has a problem with curse of dimensionality or curses of dimensionality, uh, which uh, occur because the problem size grows exponentially uh, as the number of variables increases. And Powell has talked about three different kinds of curses, growth in state, action, and outcome spaces. Um, and we'll see uh, that arising, uh, all three of those arising in some of the examples that I'll, uh, that I'll give. Uh, in discrete models, we're gonna represent the size of the state space as N sub S. And then I'm gonna talk about the size of the combined state and action space as N sub X. Um, that might be equal to the product of the size of the state space and the action space, but in fact, it may be considerably smaller if there are constraints on the actions. And the state uh, transition probability matrix that will, um, that is generally used to, to represent these problems is an NS by NX matrix, um, where I'm, uh, having states uh, and actions, the state actions on columns and the future states on rows. So this is a matrix that has, uh, is a probability matrix where columns sum to one. Uh, the focus here uh, will be on problems where I can manipulate and store vectors of size n sub x, but the matrices of size n sub s times n sub x become problematic. So, I'm, the, the focus is really on moderately sized problems. It's on pro problems that um, ways of actually solving these uh, optimally rather than using heuristics or approximations. Uh, <clears throat> not only do we often encounter moderately sized problems, but we can also use uh, fully optimal solutions to moderately sized problems to gain insights on heuristics and approximate methods for larger problems. <clears throat> One of the things that I'm gonna be using extensively in this talk is index vectors, which are basically vectors composed of positive integers. And I'll use those for extraction and expansion. They could also be used for shuffling. And I think I'll just move right along to showing how dynamic programming can, be, can use such vectors. So a dynamic programming model, let's say, that consists of two state variables that are each binary zero one variables, three possible actions. So the uh, S is listing all the possible combinations of, this, of the states, and there's four of them. And then X is listing all possible combinations of states and actions, and there's 12 of them. And I can use an expansion vector, uh, IX, to expand out uh, to find the rows of, of the X matrix associated with each state. So there's four states and IX will tell me which state uh, each row of X uh, is associated with. I'll also use um, index vectors to define strategies. So a strategy is an extraction index vector where the ith element is associated with the ith state. And so if we if we take an example of 1, 6, 7, 12, uh, going back to the X, if I take, pull out the, those rows of this X, um, you can see I've pulled out those four rows and they're associated, there's one row associated with each state. So I can define a strategy in terms of this index vector uh, I sub A, or I super A actually. Um, dynamic programming, uh, models are generally solved using either function or policy iteration. Both approaches use a maximization step where I, uh, I maximize the um, current reward and the discounted expected future value. 
uh, I'm representing that maximization problem here with that index vector ix. Um, and there'll be an associated strategy that comes out of that. Uh, function iteration simply um, uh, maps the next value, the next iteration of the value function as uh, v tilde, which is coming out of that maximization step. And policy iteration will solve, will perform a linear solve of a matrix W V equals R, uh, the the extracted R associated with the strategy, and that matrix W uh, is um, row wise diagonally dominant, which is uh, what will ensure convergence of the uh, policy iteration. <clears throat> now I want to turn to using uh, dyna doing dynamic programming with what I call expected value functions. The expected value function simply is transforming the future state vector into its expectation conditional on current states and actions. And um, we can either do a full evaluation, which maps uh, the, uh, the ns vector v plus into the uh, n sub x vector uh, that's the expectation conditioned on X, or we can do an index evaluation, which is just um, evaluating that expected value for some uh, particular strategy. Um, with the maximization step, uh, I'm simply inserting the V function, the results of the of the V function into uh, re to replace the P transpose V. And then I can also do my function and policy iteration um, using the, uh, the vector of expected values. Now notice that uh, policy iteration in particular um, can't be solved using the usual method. So if we were trying to use uh, direct methods like LUD compositions, we'd actually need the, uh, the uh, transition matrix. But if we are using uh, iterative uh, methods for solving that, for performing that linear solve, and in particular, I use uh, Krylov methods. Um, these are variants of conjugate gradient type methods or minimum residual methods. Uh, we don't need to have the actual transition matrix. All we need to be able to do is get the results of the transition times the, the V vector. Uh, Krylov methods, turn out to um, work very well in, in uh, performing the uh, Bellman updates. <clears throat> so what are the advantages to using these EV functions? Uh, essentially, it's going to be that we can evaluate them much faster and use far less memory than if we form the full transition matrix. And I want to talk about at least three situations that I've found where these are advantageous. One is if we have sparse stage transitions. So if the state transition can be written in two stages, each of which uh, has a very a sparse transition uh, matrix associated with it. So we can um, write P as a function, uh, as a product of P2, P1, and both the P1 and P2 are sparse, but their product's not. Um, when we have a an action that transforms the state deterministically into a post-decision state, uh, we also get a, um, uh, an advantage to using the post-transition state, tran uh, the post-decision state transition matrix rather than the full one. And then we can, we can perform that in, uh, in two steps where uh, we have the, a matrix A that transforms the current state and action into a post-decision state. And finally, there's uh, in factored models where each individual state can be written in terms of its own transition matrix and where those transition matrix are conditional on a subset of current states and actions. So I'm gonna take those three cases in turn. Um, the first case I'll illustrate with a stochastic patch occupancy model. These are fairly well-known um, models in uh, conservation biology. We have n sites. Each site is either empty or occupied. And the individual site transition matrices uh, 
can be written in terms of an extinction stage and a, and a colonization stage, so E and C, and both of these are triangular. Um, there's going to be two to the n possible states, so the full transition matrix would be four to the, have four to the n elements, and it'd be dense. If the transition's decomposed into the extinction and colonization phase, on the other hand, the E and C matrices have uh, three to the n non-zero elements in these matrices. So if we use sparse matrix methods, we can decompose the transition into uh, a two-step process. Um, here's a, a picture that illustrates the sparsity patterns for the extinction and colonization matrices, and you can see there's a lot of white space in those matrices. Uh, Paul? Uh -huh. So, you know, I guess this is a very diverse audience, and a lot of computer science, they may not have any idea what the kinds of models you are talking about. Could you give a little, you know, tiny bit of a background what these models are? I mean, an example, so that people understand it a little better. Um, well, uh, Just a very high level. So this this is a model where we we may be we have n sites and we may be interested in um, a situation where, um, for instance, these may be islands and we're we're looking at island uh, extinction issues and we want to manage this. Now I'm not this I haven't talked about any management uh, application here, but a management application might be where we do some sort of transfer of, of animals from one site to another. Uh, we may have a captive breeding program. Uh, so the action might be to, you know, to uh, actually place animals uh, onto uh, one of these sites if it has gone extinct on that site. Does that give you enough sense of? Yes. Okay. Um, so if we look at typical times for, 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 for doing this uh, operation, uh, the first row, so the, the columns are representing uh, different numbers of sites. The first row gives us the EV function approach where we, we do the, uh, the multiplication in two stages. The second row gives us the time it takes to actually do the matrix, mul matrix vector multiplication. And you can see that um, as we go across the, uh, a given row, uh, we're getting exponential increase in the time, but the exponential increase is much higher for the P times V um, than for the, for the um, uh, stage uh, evaluation. Uh, the other thing that one should note is that just forming the P matrix can, can be time consuming. Uh, that's shown in the third row. Uh, and it's uh, well, by the time we get to 14 uh, sites, the, um, the the transition matrix approach is already over an order of magnitude slower than uh, than the EV approach, and it takes um, a considerable amount. Of, it takes four times the uh, the uh, time uh, in this. Well, the setup time is is a one shot deal, so that 19 uh, second evaluation of the P is, is a one-shot deal, whereas the, um, I'm doing a thousand evaluations of the, of the P times V uh, approach. So uh, just an illustration of how, what kind of dramatic uh, increases in computational efficiency uh, we can get from this approach. Um, the second uh, place where this is a, a useful uh, device is uh, when we have a, uh, an action that has a deterministic effect on the state. So we have a deterministic function mapping the current states and actions into a S tilde, which is the post decision state. And then we have a transition uh, of the future state that depends only on the post transition state. So we can, de essentially we're decomposing the um, transition again into two states where the first uh, two stages, excuse me, uh, the first stage is this deterministic mapping. Um, and by the way, this I could you could um, 
see that this could help address cursive dimensionality in the action space because the only time the action space enters is in that deterministic mapping from current states and actions into post-decision states. And um, I won't say anything more about that situation, but we'll see an example of that in a minute. Uh, the rest of the talk is going to focus largely on um, factored models. And factored models can be expressed in terms of a set of variables, each with their own transition matrix. Oops. Sorry about that. I just dropped something. Um, so when we have enough conditional independence uh, in these uh, transitions, we can use a factored form and that will lead to substantial uh, computational efficiencies. And when I think, th was thinking about this, um, this problem and, and how conditional independence enters, I, 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 I thought of four different ways that, or four different levels of independence. Um, the first one is when each future state has a unique set of conditioning variables. Um, and then that's the, the sort of best case scenario. The, uh, the second is when conditioning variables involve overlapping sets of current states and actions. So in that case, I'm going to uh, have to um, do some matching of the conditioning variables across the different future states. Um, we can also have situations where conditioning variables include overlapping sets of, of, of exogenous random variables that will influence the, um, the, uh, the transition. And those, those random variables have to be integrated out or summed out of the, of the problem. And then a fourth level is when we might have future states that are causally dependent on other future states. And I'm going to give examples of the first three levels um, uh, as I go through the talk. So the first um, level one independence, since the conditioning sets um, are all uh, uh, dis that have disjoint conditioning variables, we can write the transition matrix <coughs> as a change Kronecker product. And this has uh, great advantages because then my EV function is a chain Kronecker product times a vector. And I can um, evaluate those sorts of um, uh, problems without ever forming the Kronecker product itself. So I don't actually need to form P. I can form, I can use a sequence of D matrix matrix uh, multiplications and uh, to evaluate that chained Kronecker product times vector. And I've put a little MATLAB implementation. It's quite simple. The main, the main uh, work in this is to um, do a matrix matrix multiply, which can be done very efficiently. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, Costello and Pulaski's dynamic reserve site selection problem fits into this category. In this problem, there's n sites. Each site is in one of three categories, either available in the reserve or developed. Um, and the action is to acquire sites. Um, if you don't acquire a site in a given uh, period and it's available, it could become developed with probability P, P sub I. So there could be different probabilities for different sites. Um, one site can be acquired per period at least in the simplest model. Um, and the goal here is to try to build up a reserve that's going to um, maximize uh, uh, biodiversity. So have a reserve that is providing habitat to the largest number of species. Um, and each, each site will have, be, be able to support a different set of species. So in this case, the state space is uh, size three to the n. Um, we can uh, so in this case the action, which is acquisition, will change the state deterministically. So all the action is doing is it's if we acquire a site, we move that site from the available to the reserve state. So here's a case where all I need to do in order to get the state transition is to um, represent the post decision 
state transition. So the transition from the post acquisition state into next period state. And <clears throat> I can represent that as a change Kronecker product where each of the individual site transition matrices is this three by three matrix where I have, um, I have um, a fairly small number of, uh, of non-zero elements. So in that chained Kronecker product operation, I can implement it sequentially with a uh, n times three to the n minus one operation. Now, this problem is a bit complicated because these three by three matrices are sparse and there's only four non-zeros. So the full P matrix, if I do form it, would have exactly four to the n non-zero elements. And so when I do a matrix vector multiply with the P, I have a, a four to the n operations, four to, four to the n uh, multiplication operations. So if I count, uh, look at the multiplication counts on this, um, the full matrix would be four to the n. The individual uh, doing them sequentially is n times three to the n minus one. And uh, it turns out that when n is less than eight, it's actually better to use the full matrix than to use the sequential. And it raises the possibility that we could use um, less than n submatrices, um, but not use the full uh, the full matrix itself. And I did a little sort of um, seat of the pants, back of the envelope uh, analysis of this, where if I use S submatrices in a, this evaluation, uh, the, the operation count would be given th by this expression S times uh, four thirds raised to the N over S power. Uh, and that's exact when N over S is an integer. And I can minimize that. And what I find is that the optimum number of submatrices is a fraction of N. And then we would, of course, have to round that if we were using this in, uh, in practice. Um, in practice, there actually seems to be a penalty for using more submatrices um, so that um, this optimal expression um, does not actually um, work out that way. Uh, I've put a, a graphic up here. In the interest of time, I think I'll, I'll skip discussion of this, but just note that in practice, if n is between 8 and 16, it seems that about uh, that two submatrices uh, seem to be optimal. So I would divide this problem into, um, let's say I had 16 sites, I would divide it into 8 and 8. I would form, um, I would form submatrix uh, transition matrices for for those eight element uh, for those eight sites individually, and then I would combine them in a in a two step uh, sequence, and that. Um, uses far less memory than if I form the full uh, 16 by, or two, uh, three to the 16 by three to the 16 matrix. So, um, so I don't have timing, I don't have any timing results here on that, but uh, the timing results are quite dramatic. Um, and, and in fact, uh, I can't even form uh, an N, I can't even form the P matrix with uh, N more than 15 uh, on my computer, but I can solve this problem at least up to N equals 20 and, uh, and, and probably somewhat beyond that. I'm going to switch now to the, what we, I was calling level two conditional independence. Um, this is a situation where we have uh, overlapping sets of conditional variables. So, we have D state variables. Um, I'm gonna represent the conditioning variables by a matrix X, and each row of X is representing a unique combination of states and actions. Each state will have a, a transition matrix P sub I, um, that's a CPT or conditional probability table, and it'll have an index vector associated with it that defines which conditioning or parent variables are associated with that CPT. So which columns of X 
are associated with it. So that's essentially the information that's needed uh, to, to um, form the EV function. Um, basically, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to uh, process these CPTs sequentially. And in order to do that, I need to do an index multiplication. The indices can all be pre-computed and stored so that the, the basic operation that I'm going to be doing is simply this, um, this indexed uh, multiplication operation that you see in the middle of the slide. Um, there's no memory copying or shuffling of memory required for this operation, so it can be implemented fairly efficiently. Um, each each um, uh, operation there is really a matrix uh, vector multiplication. Uh, so if I loop over k, the k, the the k, the uh, the number of values in these index vectors, then each for each k, I'll have a matrix vector multiplication. And I've implemented that in a, uh, in a C program that I can call from MATLAB. And the C program uses calls to DGEM. So uh, if you don't know what DGEM is, don't worry about it. Um, but it's a, a way of hopefully efficiently doing these matrix multiplications. And the function that's produced can be called, called for either a full evaluation or the indexed evaluation that uses a particular strategy. Um, I've got some details on these, but uh, I'm gonna skip over that. We can come back if there's interest. Um, and uh, before I give you some um, results, I just wanna point out that uh, the, ba the, the operation that I just um, suggested has a sequence of D operations. So we're sequentially processing each of the CPTs, but it may be possible to combine some of the CPTs into a, in a pre-processing step. So just like we did with the chain chronic product, we may want to have less than D submatrices, but, but not go all the way to one submatrix. And um, one, can, one can see that, uh, that combining the CPTs in a pre-processing step may have some advantages. And we'll see that in the example that I, that I have. Um, from a computer science standpoint, the optimal management of these operations is a, is a challenging uh, question. Um, a natural way to approach it would be to count arithmetic operations, although um, in current computing environments with uh, multi-threading and, and, uh, and, and cache memory issues, uh, arithmetic operations may not be the, the um, give us the whole story, but um, it's, still, it's still a useful place to start. Uh, the efficiency that these operations can be conducted in depends on a number of things, the sequence, so the order that the CPTs are processed, so um, this is the order of the, the, that the state variables are given in. Um, whether we pre-process the CPTs into groups, and then the algorithms that perform them. So the sequencing is particularly difficult, and there don't appear to be any kind of polynomial algorithms to, to, to do this. Um, we could resort to heuristics, greedy algorithms, for instance, or some kind of global optimization um, methods. The sequencing problem is like a traveling salesman problem, and so methods that work well for traveling salesman problems may work well here. Um, we, there may be graph theoretic and matrix reordering methods that are, uh, are helpful. Um, I put a question mark there. This is, this is something I've thought about, but I don't have um, I don't have, I haven't fully explored it. Let's just put it that way. Um, the grouping problem, uh, that can be solved in uh, polynomial time. Basically, there's a simple dynamic programming algorithm that uh, is, is closely related to the uh, matrix chain problem, if, for those of you familiar with that. Um, and moving right along, uh, so here's the optimal grouping. I'm gonna move on and just point out that um, 
in order to create these EV functions, um, we need three, those three pieces of information I mentioned earlier. We need the transition uh, probability matrices. We need the matrix of state action combinations. And then we need the index vectors uh, that give us the conditioning variables for each of the state variables. And I've created a MATLAB-based function to, uh, to do this. Uh, when it's passed to this data, it will return a function handle that can then be used in uh, passed to the dynamic programming solver. Uh, so it makes it a fairly simple process to implement. Let me give you an example. Um, the paper by Shadez and her associates um, on managing networks. Uh, in this uh, example, there are n sites, so it's again a spatial uh, problem. It's a network spatial problem, so the um, transition matrix will depend on the neighbors. We have an n by n adjacency matrix called well, I'll call C, and in this uh, in this um, problem, each site can be either occupied or empty. And either treated or not, and so the the, um, the the management problem is to determine which site should be treated in each period. <clears throat> um, the transition probability depends on for each site depends on whether that site's empty or occupied, treated or not treated, and if it's empty and not treated, then it might be uh, essentially colonized or infested by neighbors if those neighbors themselves are occupied and untreated. So the number of un occupied untreated neighbors will figure into the transition uh, for this if, if, the, if the site I itself is empty and not treated, is empty and not treated. And so we have a uh, transition matrix which is um, two by four plus K sub I, where K sub I is the number of neighbors for site I the total number of neighbors. Um, so the state space is two to the n. There's n plus one possible actions, including the do nothing action. So the action is basically which site do we treat or, or just do nothing. And so there are n plus one times two to the n possible state action combinations. Um, if I look at an operation count on, on uh, this problem, using the EV approach, the operation count depends on the density of the network. So I can, the networks can range from completely isolated to completely connected. And of course, the operation count is, you might expect, increases as the network becomes more connected. So I've, I've uh, Illustrated this for n up to 16, and um, the lower the, the lowest line there is when there are no neighbors. So this is a completely disconnected neighbor, uh, disconnected um, uh, network. The middle line is when we have total connection, and then the, the top line is the operation count for uh, if I use the full transition matrix. And we're this is in a log 10 scale. So you can see when we're at 16, there's almost three orders of magnitude more operations uh, using the all connected, of, of using the, uh, the, the, P, the transition matrix, the full matrix P, than using uh, the EV approach with an all connected network. And it's uh, even more dramatic uh, for a, a completely disconnected network. So huge, huge gains in efficiency and um, um, uh, and, and also not illustrated here, but the memory usage is significantly less because if I use the EV approach here, I'm, I'm not combining anything. So I don't need any extra memory except the intermediate memory that's used for um, const constructing the e EV function. Um, I applied this to a set of eight networks that were in uh, Yadin's uh, uh, paper. Uh, those are the illustrations 
Um, they're fairly disconnected networks, and here's some timing results on those. Um, the, uh, these are for eight networks. The size of the uh, network, the, the number of sites is given in the second column. And then I've got two sets of results for full evaluations, five full evaluations and 25 index evaluations. Basically the take home message is that as I increase the size of the, uh, of the network, anything above, uh, above 10 sites, I'm, I'm far better using the EV approach. Um, and the EV star is the optimally grouped one. So this is one where I have, instead of doing n evalu n, a sequence of n operations, I might do a sequence of less than n, um, but not one, which would be using the transition matrix. Um, and you can see that um, uh, the, e the optimal EV approach um, gives us somewhat better results even than just using the full N evaluations or full N sequence. I've also did some experimentation in the next table with some sort of hand-picked groupings uh, and found that I could do better than the, the, the so-called optimum, uh, which has led me to believe that um, there's some penalty, one way to think about it at least, is that there's a penalty for more, uh, having more factors and so if we have fewer factors we may be uh, able to um, do things better and that's consistent with the results from the chain chronic or product approach as well um, how are we doing for time i don't have a clock in front of me anyone so it's uh, typically we end at two thirty, and it's now two twelve. Okay. So um, so I'll, I have a few more um, slides, and uh, and then I'll open it up for questions and discussion. How does that sound? That sounds great. Okay. So so far I've talked about um, using uh, EV functions with models that are actually discrete. So the, the states and actions were all discrete. But many times we're interested in models where, in fact, the, the state and action variables are continuous. And we will typically represent uh, such systems with uh, transition rules, uh, functions, rather than with, with CPTs. So in general, I could write this as uh, the, the future state is some function of the current states and actions plus uh, some noise uh, terms where I have sp specified distributions. Now we can st still use a factored form uh, to give us computational efficiencies in this case. Uh, in this case, each, each uh, state variable would have its own uh, transition function, which would be a, a function of some subset of the, of the um, state, the current states and actions and the noise terms. And uh, one way to solve this kind of problem would be discrete, to discretize the states and actions and the noise terms and compute uh, conditional probability tables for each of the S sub i's. And I've, I've got this uh, approach implemented in my software just using linear interpolation weights as probabilities. The main issue that arises in, in this framework, uh, and it's essentially getting to that level three uh, is, um, uh, situation is that um, we may have overlapping sets of these random noise terms and that means that they can't be integrated out in the CPTs themselves. They have to be maintained and they can only be integrated out um, during the process of evaluation itself. Uh, unless, they, unless they can be uh, um, uh, unless we can group things to have uh, that so that the, the problem decomposes into subgroups of variables that have their own conditioning uh, uh, um, noise terms. Let me illustrate that um, with the, uh, this is the central flyway mallard duck model that's used by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, to set harvest levels. 
uh, when you when you kind of boil this model down, you've got two state variables, ponds and adult ducks. The ponds transition has its own noise term, so we can isolate the CPT for that. The adult ducks have their own noise terms. They're a function of all the conditioning variables, but um, uh, we can integrate out those noise terms ahead of time. Um, Here's some timing results for that for that model. If I use uh, 151 discrete values of ponds, 351 values for ducks, um, you can see that the uh, 10 full evaluations, 25 index evaluations, the time uh, using the full transition matrix is considerably more than using the index, uh, excuse me, using the EV approach. Same thing holds for if I use more discrete values, trying to get a, a finer um, uh, um, finer grid. Um, and basically, uh, full evaluation is about two times faster, and index evaluation is three to four times faster. So even in a simple model like this, uh, using the EV approach can uh, lead to substantial um, efficiencies in both in memory and computational speed. Here's a model that doesn't decompose well. This is a model that um, uh, I was working with uh, Barry Grand on. Uh, I think Barry is online. Uh, I think I saw him uh, as a participant here. Uh, so in this case, we've got a lot of noise terms, and the noise terms don't decompose. They don't really separate. And if we, if we keep this model in the way it's formed now, the EV function approach really um, can't improve on the, the full transition matrix. Uh, I did some operation counts. Uh, if I used, a, uh, if I tried to do this using the EV approach and, and uh, basically um, the operation count is not very, uh, is not very encouraging. Uh, the, the, the big, Bottleneck here is in the second operation, which um, ends up having a, a, a lot of oper a lot of multiplications in it because I've still got all I've still got four noise terms that are included in the in the uh, evaluation, and um, it's possible that it might be better, but in general, at least as it's as it's currently uh, uh, set up it would not be useful to use an EV approach in this model. I got to thinking about this actually this morning, uh, and uh, it seemed to me that there's a couple changes that might help. Um, one is that I could combine the noise terms so that I, so if you notice here, I've got essentially two noise terms, harvest noise and other mortality noise. If I combine those into single survivor noise, um, uh, I would reduce the number of, of uh, variables, of noise variables. And the other thing is if I represented this with a stage transition where I um, introduce an extra juvenile category and then I have a two-stage representation and I've drawn a picture of what that would look like. And this would, this, um, so in this case, each state variable is, is um, evolving over time into a, a sort of a pre-advancement stage. So um, there's survival and harvest impacts on each stage. And then there's a new juvenile stage, which, which is um, the, the, new, uh, the new young. And, um, and then at the end of this stage, before the transition to the next period, then I would advance. So in this, for, for in this case, the fawns would advance to being either does or immature bucks um, in a 50-50 ratio. And the immature bucks would, would, some of them would stay as immature bucks and some of them would become mature bucks. I think there's a 60-40 ratio of those. So in this case, we actually could then have a staged model uh, that decomposes very nicely and would have considerable efficiencies. So wrapping up, um, 
basically these EV functions can replace the use of transition probability matrices. They use far less memory typically and can be evaluated far faster, sometimes by orders of magnitude. Um, the procedures for creating these are being incorporated into the next release of the MDP Solve software, um, which I've now got up on GitHub, so it can be downloaded um, in working form. Uh, the, um, and let's see, what else do I really need to say here? Um, so the sequence of operations uh, when we do these EV evaluations in the general um, framework, uh, that's still, there's still many open questions about how to optimally organize the operations. And I've made some headway on that, but uh, there's still more work to be done. And I think with that, I will conclude and open it up. Thank you. So, do we have any questions? Yeah, I have a question. This is Tom Dietrich, and my video should be coming on momentarily. Hi, Tom. Um, hi, Paul. Uh, so, um, the, uh, it's interesting that you're showing that the EV method, as, as I understand it, the EV method actually requires doing more multiplications uh, in each uh, value function iteration um, as opposed to having done all those multiplications once and computing the the giant transition matrix no actually you're doing far fewer multiplications that's where the advantage comes in well if I have the entire transition matrix I have one matrix vector I have one a dot product that I have to do to calculate that expectation for each state yes so I have a matrix vector uh, one giant matrix vector multiply. Um, whereas under your approach, I have factored the, the transition matrix into a product of these various smaller matrices. Um, and, uh, and it would seem like I would have, uh, but, you, but you're saying the operation count for, for those smaller multiplications is still less than, than, uh, than having, uh, even though I have to do it repeatedly in each iteration of value iteration, um, you still come out ahead. It would seem to depend on how many iterations of value iteration it's going to take, I guess. Um, so here's, here, this, this, maybe this example will help clarify what's going on. So if we have three state variables and one action variable, um, then I'm going to perform the EV operation in one step, or excuse me, in three steps. And the first step, uh, so each of these steps has, uh, is, so if all the state variables have, have n values, and then the action has n sub a values, and we, we're using uh, th that full uh, space of uh, states and actions, uh -huh. then each operation has, is an n to the 4 times n a operation. And okay. basically what's happening there is that um, the first, in the first step, we have all of the future states in the, in the intermediate product but we only have one of the current states and the action in the, in the P sub I, the P sub one. Okay. So, so I don't, I have a smaller set of operations. Whereas if I was doing this, the full transition matrix, oh, and so then the second step, I've gotten rid of the first future state. Now I only have the second and third future state. And again, I only have, uh, I don't have the third current state in there. So it's again, you mean, an, and you're by, referring to state variables. Yes. Right. Okay. So, so in the second step, I have future states two, two and three, and current states one and two. So again, I only have an n to the four times n a operation there, and the same thing holds. So basically, what's happening in, when you're sequencing these operations is you're reducing the number of future states in each step. Right. And you may, and you're adding in current states and actions. And so what you're trying to do is add in those current states and actions as slowly as possible. So you want to pick the, the, uh, the, the, the future states that are conditioned on a small number of, of current states and actions. And that's where the advantage comes in. And notice that if we, so we have, a three operations that are n to the four times n to the a, 
whereas it, we're using the full transition matrix, we'd have an n to the six times n to the eight operation. So right, I guess my yeah, exponentially okay. exponentially larger uh, operation. Okay, thank you. So we have a question here. Okay. Hi, Paul. Thank you for your nice talk. Uh, I have a little question. Um, it sounds like EV approach is a memory and computational efficient method than the traditional model based of planning for the MVP problem. Uh, I was thinking about how do you compare this model based of planning approach to those model free learning approach like SASA or Q learning? Or do you think about how to combine these two methods? I, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't quite hear what the question was. You, you introduce Q learning methods? Uh, I was thinking about uh, how do you compare this model based of planning approach to those model free learning approach? Uh, I don't. <laughs> That's the simple answer. I don't really use the, the um, those um, model free methods. So I, I really don't have much that, to say about those. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've never really used them. Okay, since, since I think uh, here you can reduce the cost of the uh, transition model. Um, but actually we can use some simulator to get rid of this transition model but learn from it. Uh, I don't know whether it is much efficient than the model based on planning approach. Mm -hmm. I'm curious about it. Mm -hmm. right, thank you. No, thank you. So I, we should wrap up soon. I, I was just curious. How scalable is this? Uh, you know, how many variables do, uh, can you handle? I mean, you and of course, I mean, clearly it depends on the problem. It depends how you can decompose the problem, etc. But uh, uh, could you give us some idea? And you know, a final question is: Could you tell us a little bit about your software? You know. I mean, the big vision you have in terms of how you are distributing it, and uh, you know, I actually don't know. Is it written the language it's written in? If you would like people to add modules, or you know. Okay. Um, the first question is how big can this can you get, and and a lot of that's going to depend on the on the model and how many state variables you have in each of the factors. So, you know, for instance, that. Um, that uh, reserve site selection problem, you had uh, uh, three states per site, and uh, I've solved that problem, you know, up to up to twenty sites. Uh, it probably could go more. Uh, I just didn't feel like, you know, waiting. I mean, you're going to have to wait. Is uh, the the big limitation uh, there is you know basically time because uh, so long as you can get the so long as you can get vectors that are, um, uh, you know, of the of the of the size of the state and action space, if you can get those in, in, you know, and you'll probably need a few of those. So you need to you you may be limited by your memory, and then in terms of, you know, how much patience you have. Do you do you let it run all night or do you, you know, let it run for days? Um, at that point, you know, if, if, if you have a big enough problem, you could, you know, but you can get things into memory, then you could solve those. So like I say, I've gone up to 20 and uh, with the reserve site selection. Um, one of the papers that I, I read on this, uh, this problems claimed that more than seven was going to be impossible. And that's simply not true. Um, now, you know, that's a situation where each site has, each state variable has a very small number of values. If you are doing these population um, manage, uh, wildlife population management kinds of models, uh, each state might have, you know, 20, 40, 100. Um, I mean, I was doing it with m even more because it's, you're discretizing a continuous variable. So, you know, the, the number that you can you can use um, will influence the 
the degree of approximation. Mm -hmm. You know, you could get a, a rough a, approximate solution with a smaller number of, of grid points. Um, so it's, it's, again, basically going to be constrained by the amount of memory and, uh, uh, and, and, and time that you want to devote to, you know, computer time that you have to devote to it. You know, the, the, the main takeaway here, though, is that if you use this approach, you're going to be way better than using the transition probability approach. Mm -hmm. You don't have to form that. Um, that whole matrix. So the second question you raised was um, about the software. So this is this I, I call it MDP Solve. It's a MATLAB based package. Um, it's uh, uh, basically a, a package that's designed to help ease the, pro the, the problem of specifying dynamic optimization problems and then solving them. So it's a, um, a set of tools I'm currently writing a, uh, a textbook that's based on those. I have a draft out to publishers on that now. Um, I've used it in a class I teach uh, each spring. Uh, it's an online class actually, so people can take it from anywhere they want if, they're, if they can come up with the uh, tuition fee. Um, and uh, it's available as a website for it and it's also, I've, I'm, switching over to GitHub and learning how to use GitHub. Um, my, my hope is actually that it starts to be um, used by other developers that, so that I'm not doing all of the development work on that. I, I view it as, a, as an open source system uh, mm -hmm. and am encouraging other people. In fact, I know Tom, I, I, I've, been meaning to get in touch with you about integrating some of your approaches uh, to approximate dynamic programming into that system so that, uh, you know, there's a sort of common model specification framework that can be uh, then farmed out to different, uh, to different uh, uh, solution techniques. Right. Well, sounds great. Actually, you know, Warren Powell is also a, uh, uh, very much into you know approximate uh, uh, dynamic programming etc yeah and so, it would it'd be great to put his his approaches into this framework as well yeah. and i kind of view the mdp solve approach as uh providing a both a model specification framework and a um and a solution framework and uh, currently, the, the solution part is simply using uh, the standard policy uh, and function iteration approaches, but it would be certainly useful, I think, to, uh, to add in some of these uh, approximate dynamic programming approaches as well as alternative solution techniques. Okay, very good. Let's thank again. Thank you. Uh, in two weeks, we'll have another seminar by Professor Christian Kirsten. So we'll announce the title of the talk soon. And thanks again, Paul. Thank Bye -bye. you. This is great. Thanks a lot.